Dr. C.W., my co-moderator, to come on the stage first before starting the session. And then I would like to invite His Excellency uh, Pan Sorsa, Minister of Ministry of Commerce, come to the stage. Please give applause to him. His Excellency uh, Pan Solsa, <coughs> he is uh, one of the main driver of the use of ICT technology in public sector. And at the Ministry of Commerce, he initiated the lead of implementation of, co of uh, Ministry ICT master plan and the trade in information website and was responsible for the moderni modernization of the Ministry ICT infrastructure. He also involving a lot in terms of trade and SME promotion as well. So next, I would like to invite Mr. Timpony Snow, Solution Architect, Cybersecurity from Cisco. Please give an applause. <laughs> next, I would like to invite Excellency Juk Bunna, Secretary of State of Ministry of Civil Service. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Ning Mao, Deputy Director General of ICT in charge at the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication. <laughs> Last but not least, I would like to invite Mr. Hu, an uh, enterprise architecture from uh, Vitel Group. Please come to the stage. So before starting the session, I would like to start briefly the, op the, the objective of this session. This session will focus on digitalization of the government towards smarter governance for sustainable economic growth and social stability. This session will open up the discussion on new digital government, train, and issue, including Oh, sorry, sorry. I forget. So I forget, Mr. Mr. Hang Yongsia, Senior Director of, from Huawei International. Please give an applause. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> so my my apology for the mistake, right? <laughs> so. Once again, I would like to start the sessions. So first of all, let, uh, I would like to invite Excellency Pan Solosa, Minister of Commerce, to give a keynote speech. Yeah, thank you. Excellency Secretary of State, Excellency Komakara, Under Secretary of State, Mr. Timothy Snow, Solution Architect, Cybersecurity Cisco, Excellencies, Distinguished Panelists, ex Ladies and Gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to attend with you today this important event on the topic of digital government. It is a very interesting topic indeed, as we are in the era of uh, digitalizations where there exists a pl plethora of opportunities for us to leverage technologies, be it for business, social activities, but also in the area of public governance and service deliveries. The Ministry of Commerce has always been very proactive in making use of technologies in the public governance. 
allow me first to dive a little, little into the past. That is from 2010, where the Ministry of Commerce undertook the first modernization of its ICT infrastructure. Prior to that, a centralized infrastructure was non-existent. Isolated or standalone systems are scattered all over the place within the ministries. Using a project fund that was being implemented by the Ministry of Commerce at that time, we formulated a, an ICT master plan in order to upgrade and modernize the, the ICT infrastructure across the board in the Ministry of Commerce. With that, a state-of-the-art facility was built, including a centralized data center equipped with the most up-to-date at that time, um, hardware, race floor, fire suppression systems, and so on, automatic backup generators, fingerprints access. The data center is connected to the provincial departments of commerce through fiber optics, lease line to access storage and internet directly from the ministry, and by doing so, eliminating, eliminated the need for any standalone systems. But physical infrastructure represents only one piece in a vision of a holistic and forward-thinking. Forward the Ministry of Commerce was not modernizing the necessary hardware, but used it as the backbone toward transforming the way the Ministry of offers its various public services. It is always that the Ministry's vision is to provide with Automated, automated services. And in 2015, the Ministry of Commerce rolled out its certifi uh, certificate of origin uh, automation systems. Well, the systems was the first of its kind that allows the exporter to submit application for various certif uh, certification of origin, we call COs, over the internet at their own convenience time and place. And payments are made electronically via payment gateways of partner banks and associated financial institutions. The applications are then processed in a streamlined manner with limited human in interventions. And once the COs are approved, the applicants are notified and will be able to generate and print out the COs by themselves. All of these can be achieved without the need of, to come directly to the ministry's premises. The ministry has since upgraded the systems allowing for applicant, application for additional COs forms and the process of linking the system to Cambodia national single windows, which in turn link to ASEAN single windows. With these systems, we actually, in 2015, won the first prize of Cambodia ICT award in a public sector category, thanks to um, Ministry of Post and Telecom. As a natural progress, progression of these uh, visions, the Ministry of Commerce has taken another steps in automating another business operation of the ministries. That is the, the uh, business administrations, sorry, the business registration automation systems. Similar to the CO automation systems, the online process allows the applicants to submit their to submit their business registration needs over the internet, and upon upon approval, will receive a computer-generated certificates of incorporation by emails, and that can be printed out and used officially. I would like to emphasize that by taking the systems online, the Ministry of Commerce had to undertake a number of reforms and eliminated some non-essential requirements to ensure smooth operation and shorter processing time. Likewise, through the CO system, all payments are made online. But if you are to stay essential in the fast-paced, rap rapid evolutions of the digital age, we have to continue to look for ways 
to improve and take another step forward. Currently, the Ministry of Commerce Systems as a whole are standing alone and isolated again. <laughs> the natural revolution is to link all systems from various ministries and institutions to one central system or a common platform we call that act as a portal to all public services offered by the government where data are, are exchanged seamlessly, allowing for an enterprise service delivery to the public. I'm pleased to inform that the idea has been proposed and the Ministry of Commerce is fully committed to these initiatives. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in spite of the, the above accomplishments, it would be pointed, pointed out that digitalization and modernization process require committed and dedicated leadership to ensure the objectives are realized. One has to take upon oneself that digitalization is not a do and done, but it's rather a when. Therefore, with this in mind, it is critical that detailed assessments are conducted in terms of financing, cost effectiveness, and scalable soft and hard infrastructures, human resource availability, to name a few. In some area, a concerted effort across the entire government landscape is needed to solve the issue at hand. From the past, allow me now to divert your attention to the present and beyond on how e-commerce works in digital area. With the advent of cloud storage, many opportunities have opened up and it's therefore our vision to utilize and take many advantages from the cloud technology to implement digital governance, which move us step, a step closer toward realizing the fourth industrial revolution, the IT of things. Well, we are in the process of implementing what I call attendance, performance, and reward systems. Let me explain a bit on this. Uh, we will install um, uh, an intelligent camera in, uh, in the ministries. And our officials will go in and out. That camera ca would know their face by looking at the, uh, the tag that they, they have to wear, almost like this, and they uh, match up with the face. So we do, by doing that, uh, they know that the, that uh, person is present. First of all, it's present in the, in the ministry. So it's recorded as such. The camera is scattered all over, but you know, you, some people say that the privacy is gone now. But um, you look at the uh, people uh, who are working or are not working uh, to at the end of the month or at the end of uh, three months or so, we can look into their performance. Uh, if the person is working and producing um, the project that was given to them. So with that, we can measure their performance. And of course, the reward will be given also. Rewards as bonus and also as promotions. So you can see that, uh, that once that, that, is, that the system is implemented, we can uh, do more by streamlining our uh, human resource resources and bypassing also some of the uh, um, issues that uh, our officials are facing, like they come and they don't do anything and you know, just bring up uh, more of these uh, efficiencies in the ministries. And with that also we can analyze the uh, exchange communication amongst uh, offices. For example, we need to um, place office that are working together 
day by day or on a daily basis, we need to bring them together. This is some kind of analysis that I have to work on so that they don't have to walk, you know, half kilometers just to do uh, some business. And in that also, we can do human resource management. Um, in that cloud technology also, I'm putting what we call monitoring and evaluation, m and E's for result, result-based work. Um, for each, I call divisions or, or departments and so on, uh, to, uh, to make sure that they, uh, each task that was given will be accomplished on time. So we can take a look at their, their, their work through a, a, a record, through cloud record, uh, recording, to make sure that uh, the, uh, the process, the projects will be on time. We put also what we call trade profile Wikipedia which allows uh, people, especially our people, to access information readily by smartphone, by any devices, so that uh, you can uh, look for any vocabularies about in trade, or you can learn um, trade between two countries, between Cambodia, China, whatever, and then they, you can, uh, they, uh, the information is readily available in your hand. Of course, there is a personal cloud storage for staff. People can use cloud. You don't have to carry heavy computer, just a, a smartphone that you can access your information, your personal information also. This is just uh, to name a few that uh, uh, we intend to use for the cloud technology for the first, first time. Another topic that the ministry is actively working on is the area of e-commerce. At that note, I am faced pleased to inform you that a number of activities that ministries is currently working on, that is, for the past six months, the Ministry of Commerce is still steadfastly updating its fourth generation's trade strategy called Cambodia Trade Integration Strategies 2019-2023, which the support from the relevant agencies, private sectors, and the development partners. We have dedicated chapters, have allocated to the up updated strategy focusing on e-commerce and digital economy and industrial revolutions. In the meantime, the Ministry of Commerce will begin in earnest the formulations on e-commerce strategy with a focus on micro SMEs and cross-border trade and how they can leverage technologies to improve the market access and client base. We foresee and welcome active participation from private sectors who are well established in the e-commerce transactions, like from China, for example. In, pipeline for, in the pipeline for late 2019, a project will be developed to realize the potential of e-commerce in Cambodia through the promotion of service trade, cross-border e-commerce, and access by access key bottlenecks faced by the private sectors in developing e-commerce solutions with a special focus on cross-border trade. Before I conclude my remarks, my spe special thanks to the organizer, the Ministry of Post and Telecom, and all sponsors making this event happen. I'm a strong believer in technology, and I see that digital trans transformations that have arrived so far will only escalate even more rapidly. The public sector, which is the slowest to adopt changes, cannot stand still or risk left behind in this fast evolving world. There are disruptions and challenges, of course, for use, but with a strong political will in all aspects to carry out necessary technologies, adoptions, and reforms, everything could suddenly be accomplished. And with that note, I conclude my remarks, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. His Excellency Pan Sol Sa. So, <laughs> so next, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Timponi Snow to come on the stage to give the. Yes. Yes. Please. You do that then. To give the presentation. So. All right. Good afternoon.
first off, I want to uh, I want to say thank you to the esteemed panelists and Excellency um, for the for the invite. As one of the only vendors here, um, it's quite a nice place to uh, to be. And, and as an engineering lead uh, from Cisco, um, I'm also humbled to be uh, to be invited. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, the state of security. Let's see how we go. Point it over here. Do I need to be over here? That's okay. All right. We can do it like this. I don't need this. Um, so the last 20 years in security, how many people have been in IT for 20 years? A couple, uh, a couple hands. Right? Let's talk about the evolution. If whoever's at the back can do the control for me. So we said, 1999, when you connect to the internet, don't put your personal information online, right? Don't trust anyone. Push the button if you can. Okay, don't meet people from the internet. Don't put your information online and don't get into a stranger's car, right? Isn't that what we said? Especially if you have little kids, you may say uh, stranger danger. Fast forward to today, click. How I got here to this event, I was in my hotel room. I used an app to call a person I don't know, right, a grab driver. They arrived, I got in their car, and I paid by credit card. All the things that I was told to never do 20 years ago. And then lastly, if you click again, in the future, when we move to digital currencies, I'm going to do that same transaction, but it's going to be paid with a coin that has what kind of value? What's the value in that coin? It's not paper money anymore. This is digital disruption. This is evolution. Um, this is the way things are, are going. His Excellency talked about the move to cloud. It is an unstoppable force. This will happen. Cambodia will change. The region will change. The question will be is, for you that are in business, are you going to adapt? Are you going to be disrupted or potentially destroyed? Now let's talk about security, if you can, if you can click. So what does digital disruption mean to you? Again, please. Is it this? Is this digital disruption? The picture on the right? I don't know if you've ever seen this, but when I go into a restaurant and I see friends going out for dinner, and they're all like this, it breaks my heart. And we don't connect like that, right? Or, as His Excellency talked about, is digital disruption connecting things? Is it, is it cryptocurrencies and coins? Is it um, startups? like Grab and Uber and Airbnb and Netflix. Some of these companies are the biggest in their industry and they don't own assets. Take Airbnb as an example. Number one supplier of rooms in the world. They don't own a hotel. Netflix, the number one movie house in the world. They don't make movies. I mean, they may make some TV shows. Um, Amazon, right? It's all about being in the middle to do the supplying, supplying part. You don't have to be the creator. Go backwards for me. One. Uh, back again. This is going to be difficult. There you go. Or at the bottom, if you're talking about smart and connected governments, being able to apply for a certificate to do business online instead of going to wait in a, in a building and sitting in a queue and all that stuff. I got an idea. I want to register a company. I should be able to click, 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 get my stuff done. All right, so how is the digital government um, uh, engaging? Can I apply for licenses and patents? And what about smart and connected cities and things like that? That is true digital disruption. Of course, the other picture is as well, especially if you have kids. Um, next slide, please. So we all know about threats. As a cybersecurity solutions architect within Asia Pacific, I get calls from customers all the time. Daily. In fact, this morning I had a customer from another ASEAN country saying, we've seen something bad and we've never seen it before. And these calls occur all the time. The world is under attack. Okay? We're seeing an increase in volume. Some customers, if you look at the, the Cisco um, Capabilities Benchmark Index, 69% uh, of customers have more than 5,000 alerts per day. 5,000 events that they need to go and research. Some customers have even more than 10,000. 
uh, click again for me, please? Now, the problem is only half of those are being investigated. Think about that for a second. 5,000 events come in per day. All of them may be equally bad, and we only choose half to investigate. How do we know we're investigating the right half? What if we miss something? What can happen to our business? The chart you see at the bottom is the, is the respondent rate for events. So let's take Thailand as an example. They investigate approximately 37% of the volume of events coming in. That's only what they choose to look at, right? Pretty, pretty scary. Next slide, please. What happens if we don't do security properly? Please, if, if you can. What can happen to our business if we don't investigate the right event? So we've got this kind of coming together of forces. We have the bad guys over here, the attackers. What do they have? They've got a lot of time, 24 hours a day. They're finding out how to get into your environment. Number two, they may have support by a government, by an agency, by a group, an activist group. They also have tools and technology that maybe we don't have. And they have, number four, probably the most important thing, motive, determination to breach your environment, right? Your agency, your company, your whatever. Why? Because you have something they want, right? It's not just your bank account details, your customer. Maybe they want to destroy your image. Now, us, on the other side, this is where I try and help my customers, as the defenders, the good guys, right? What do we have to do? The first thing we have to do is we have to be right all the time. We have to be perfect every single day, 24 hours a day, even though we only do business nine to five. And we have what? Limited budgets. Every year you don't get, you know, 100% increase of budget, right? We've got lack of skill set. This is not just a problem in Cambodia. Uh, this is an ASEAN problem. In fact, it's a worldwide problem. We have underemployment meaning there's not enough skilled researchers, uh, reverse engineers, malware examiners, those sorts of people. They're just not there. And if you can find them, you've got to pay a lot of money too. So this shows that we have to be right every single day. We have to be perfect. Okay? And as we know, we can read about it every day. Uh, we're not perfect. The bad guys always seem to find a way in. Next slide, please. And what happens when they do? What happens when they do? Um, you can look online for a bunch of reports. One is the A.T. Kearney report that talks about, in ASEAN, click please, um, $750 billion uh, of, of uh, potential uh, market capitalization lost. If you read about Equifax, if any of you heard of the, about them, they lost 150 million um, customer credit cards and addresses and social security numbers. The problem with that wasn't just the data they lost, this is a chart showing their market, um, their market cap and their, their share price. It went from $135 down to 95. Okay, 35%. Do you know what that represented? 5.2 billion US dollars in two weeks. One fourth of the Cambodian GDP lost in two weeks due to their share price. I have other customers, I won't mention their names, um, that deal with this same sort of stuff every single day. And there's new ASEAN mandatory breach notification laws that are going to be coming out that's saying if you're breach, you have to report it. So what happens if you're a public tra publicly traded company and this is your stock price? Right? Scary, uh, scary place to be. If you can click again, please. So if the average is approximately 30% uh, market cap loss, if we take the top 1,000 publicly listed companies in ASEAN and we take 30% of that, it represents approximately $750 billion of valuation at risk if we don't do cybersecurity properly. Okay? Next, please. All right. So what is the current situation? Again, um, I think the, the information sharing regionally is, is, uh, can be better. As a, as a nice way to put it. I think we don't have um, the proper sharing um, that we should. I think we still have uh, underinvestment in security. 
in, in general from things like um, national operations centers, cyber operations, um, that sort of thing. Our customers, or many of my customers, still look at security as an IT cost, not a business risk. So when the IT head of IT or head of security says, I need some money to buy a particular product, they go, oh yeah, budget's a little bit light, you know, we've got to roll out this other project. If you don't do security properly and you roll that app out or you roll that new system out and the company is breached, that cost will be 10x, 20x, 30x, which you could have um, leveraged to build out the, the, the solution properly. Um, and then lastly, we have a paucity of, of, uh, of skilled talent. We have a, a shortage. If any of you in the room have tried to hire um, a SOC analyst, uh, you know how difficult it is finding that right person and competing with every other vendor that's offering them lots of money. It's very, uh, it's very challenging. Uh, click, please. So I think we, we can do a little bit better at looking at the risk, sharing information across um, nations, um, even programs like CERT, uh, financial sector sharing, um, uh, sharing malicious information that they're, that they're seeing amongst, uh, amongst themselves, looking at what is the priority um, at a national level. So I think that's probably for uh, the excellencies to, uh, uh, to take away. How are we going to secure Cambodia's journey into uh, industrialization 4.0? And security has to be part of it. Uh, next, please. Next, one more. All right, so what is Cisco doing? Um, we are building and acquiring new technologies. Uh, we've spent about five billion in the last four years on buying um, companies and, and products. And the reason is simple. We wanna be able to provide security at the network layer, on the endpoint, and in the cloud. At the network layer, we have our traditional security services like firewall and IPS and, and analytics and that sort of thing. On the endpoint, we're taking care of the migration from antivirus to proper endpoint protection. You might have heard of it called EDR, EPP. So we have an endpoint play. Um, and then lastly, it, as customers move to the cloud, like His Excellency mentioned, when you move a workload, when you move an application to the cloud, just because it's not in your far walls doesn't mean you're not responsible for it, right? You still have to do security. And sometimes it's even more challenging because you can't control the physical location of that device. It can be in whoever cloud, right? So Cisco is providing a bunch of security uh, offerings for protecting applications and workloads in the cloud. Um, click, please. And then the last one, tying all of that together, um, we have one, one uh, group within Cisco that takes care of research, um, product updates, everything to do with protecting these systems that help our customers. So if we have a customer in North America or Europe or something like that, see a threat come in, our customers in Cambodia are, uh, are all protected as well. That's what our cloud intelligence team does. So they provide that protection across all of our systems right, in one spot, which is in the, in the cloud. Next. So what are we doing within the region? Um, the first one is, is our Cisco uh, CISO uh, in the US, his name is John Stewart, uh, worked with the Australian government to create their uh, cybersecurity policy. The second one would be uh, Japan for the Tokyo Olympics, like what we did in, in uh, Rio in London to be able to protect um, the, uh, the Olympic games from um, uh, adversaries. The third one, what we've done in Singapore, we just announced that we built a national security operations center, um, also referred to as the, um, um, the Center of Excellence, CO, COE. Um, so the Singaporean government is looking at traffic coming into and out of the island nation as a whole. They are building, um, they are training people to do uh, research, analysis, they've got programming farms, they're really taking it to the next level. And then lastly, Cisco has, has uh, partnered with Interpol um, to be able to share information about individuals and groups and that sort of stuff, right? We're the, uh, the only one that's, uh, that's done that. Uh, next, please. So what can we do to be more prepared? Um, I think looking at the national level, uh, at uh, something like an RAC, uh, an assessment uh, framework. Um, the second one is, is make sure that 
when you're deploying technology or when we're building um, new SOCs or, or data centers, that security is, is, uh, is baked in at the beginning, right? that it's part of your, your recipe. Um, when we evaluate vendors, many of my customers struggle with 10, 20, 30 different products, 30 different vendors in their environment, and none of them work together. So they've got one product that does some things very, very well, and it doesn't talk to another system. They've got to figure out a way to make it work together. Right? That's, it, it's not working very well. Um, and then lastly, I was speaking with uh, Dr. Uh, Sopiep um, about um, uh, doing enablement for and, and at the universities. Can we come in um, and, and talk to um, the students and get the next generation of, uh, of cyber warrior, if you, um, if you will. So as they come out through university, they, they know exactly where to go. The banks are going to want them. The other financial institutions, everyone's going to want these individuals. Okay? It's a great, uh, great place to be. Okay. Next, please. Then the last thing what I tell my customers um, is uh, you don't have to be the first one to adopt technology. Just don't be the last. Kind of like if you're camping and a bear comes, you don't have to be the fastest runner. Just don't be the slowest. Okay? So it, it's how you adopt technologies, not saying to let others go and try and, and, and fail first. Um, but yeah, again, make sure security is, is part of it. Uh, next. Look at uh, what if scenarios. So some of my most advanced customers will do, um, you know, if this happened, what, what would I do? Right? How would I, um, how would I protect my, uh, my environment? Next. So play those what if scenarios one more time. Lastly, um, the users are going to do what they're going to do. If you say, don't bring, bring your own device, they're going to bring their own device. If you say, don't play Facebook at the office, they're going to play on Facebook. If you say, don't plug in your, your phone to your computer and do Bluetooth tethering so you can get online, that's exactly what they're going to do. Don't click, they're going to click. Okay? So the idea is protect the people, protect your assets, which are your people, inside the office, outside of the office, if they're connecting to your data center or they're connecting to the cloud, wherever. Lastly, be on the lookout for malicious insiders. I've seen this before where um, we found someone in the, in the IT team that, that, you know, they had taken a, uh, taken a payment from someone and, and uh, they were doing something they shouldn't be doing on the, on the inside of the network. Last one. We should think about security um, as a whole. Authenticate and authorize every device that comes into the environment. Make sure you understand and know what it's doing and what it should be doing and who the user, um, and who the user is. Um, and then lastly, watch out for that. If you see something, being able to take action. So security is like a life cycle, okay? You see and you authenticate and you authorize. You monitor, and if you see something bad, you should be able to take um, an, an action if that user does uh, something wrong. So with that, I think I'm, I'm out of my 15 minutes. Uh, Akun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us about the security aspect. Mr. Timonis, no, please have a seat. Yes. Uh, yes. Actually, I have discussed uh, with my co-moderator that we changed it with the rule of the game that uh, since our two uh, speaker has already shared with us the insight of digitalization, the, uh, the demand of digitalization and the adoption of digital technology for the use in the digital government, in particular by His Excellency Pan Sosa regarding to the adoption of digital technology in the Ministry of Commerce and the support for the trade facilitation and as, as, well, as well as the promotion of SME, trade promotion of SME as well. And at the same time, when we do the adoption of digital technology, we also need to consider all the negative side of the digital technology as well. In particular, come from the cybersecurity point of view. Then uh, Mr. Timpani Snow has mentioned about the three major factor is regarding the user system and device itself that in order to take into account the whole protection of uh, in the cybersecurity sphere, we need to take into account the, the three key uh, factor of that. 
together. Anyway, I would like to take in the. This is a, a very good chance for us to ask a question. So I will. I would like to give to the floor to give one to ask one question or two questions to our speaker before that uh, we liberate uh, we liberate them to 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 the floor. Any question? Please, please, please. Say hello to keynote speaker and co-moderator. I have sim uh, three simple questions. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> for the first question, I want to know why we need to digitalization of Cambodia. And the second question is about uh, how to organize and operate of digital government, including tool or its implementation. And the last question, I want to know about who are the stakeholders of digital government? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think that some of the questions uh, should be asked uh, and the, the panelists will give the answer later on. But however, I would like to summarize the question and uh, for example, regarding the the, the question number two to Excellency Pansosa to give the, the answer to the to, to them. The second question is the how to digitalize, right? Yeah. Uh, how to digitalize the the, uh, the, the government, right? Um, as you know that uh, we need to have a, a, in order to facilitate trade in order to facilitate investment and people, and business people as a whole. We do business. Um, we need transparencies. We need accountabilities. We need time. I mean, faster time. Um, what we need to do in order to have those three in, um, you know, in, in a package so that we can uh, uh, please the, uh, the investors or, or, or business people as a whole, because business people interact with us at the uh, interact with us at the uh, at the ministries like company registration. I was talking about online company registrations, COs online, and those are um, being digitalized. You ask me how we have to work on technologies. Technologies evolve. Uh, first of all, in, in the past 10 years ago, you work without cloud. For example, we're trying to uh, program um, each uh, standalone programs to do, uh, to do uh, certain things. Like company registration was done by, uh, by standalone programs. But that when you cannot access, uh, you cannot interface, you cannot uh, transfer information to other group of people who, are, who needs this kind of information also. There, there's, a, uh, there's a progress that we need to, uh, to evolve, to, we need to move according to the te technologies. How we do it, we have to catch up with uh, what, whatever technologies is uh, offered to you, starting from standalone programs, computers, standalone computers, into networking computers, network computers, into wireless, you, you start to have Wi-Fi, right? Before you don't have Wi-Fi, so you, you work. So uh, programs have to move from one step of one stage to another in order to help and facilitate the investors and business people. That's the goal. Well, I'm, I'm saying here, again, why we get into, I'm going to the why, but how is you have to cope 
with the technologies. Now you're talking about cloud technologies. The cloud technologies allow you to do a lot of things faster, more convenient. And uh, if you're stuck with the old technologies, then eventually you, 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 you won't have equipment, you won't have the, um, hardware or software to run a new technology, uh, like a, a cloud-based technologies. So the, the intention is moving forward to make sure that you are up to date. Otherwise, you, you, are, you, you will be left behind. And by, by left thing behind, by, by leaving behind, then you're not satisfying the need of, of your customers. I'm seeing my ministries is serving the customers. The customers need to be served properly. Need, you need to please them. You need to um, uh, facilitate them so they can make more money and then they can do more business. So you're looking at the, uh, the, the, this technology, you have to cope with that all the time. So um, what I'm saying here, move from one state to another is, is a, a, a vision, is you take leadership to look into it, otherwise you will be left behind. Thank you. Thank you. One last question, please, if you have. <clears throat> Yes, please, one last question. Uh, what is the government's financial stance on uh, financial institutions moving their data to keeping their customer information in the cloud? Or, or keep, or does the data need to stay within the borders or can it be international? I think I yes. If I I I I, I try to, because we cannot hear you well. Can you say again uh, louder? Uh, sure. Please? What is the government's stance on uh, financial institutions moving their data to the cloud, and does the cloud data need to stay within Cambodia? Okay. You, please ask this question again uh, during the panel discussion. So, so thank you for the questions, and uh, the last question will be answered later on. So please, uh, the audience, give an applause to our keynote speaker, His Excellency Pan Sosa, Minister of Commerce, and also Mr. Timberny Snow, uh, Solution Architect from Cisco, right? Thank you. So now we're going to start our panel discussions. And uh, before starting the panel discussion, I would like uh, to give a uh, few minutes to my co-moderator to give a short presentation and for orientation uh, to the panel discussion. Right. Thank you, thank you. Next slide. Next, next slide. Next. Next. Okay. Okay. So. Excellency. Excellency, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, actually, we also have a panel discussion on digital government in Cambodia in the next uh, 50 minutes, okay. So before we start, I would like to uh, browse through a few slides. The purpose here is to set the proper sand, okay, to better understand the issue and the major topic around digital government in Cambodia. So I would like to, to make use of the following slide to align our thought. So as we will go into discussion, okay. 
So uh, this is the first lie. Actually, I have used it in a digital infrastructure. There are four A's, you know, as the policy goals or regulatory goals of digital infrastructure and digital economy. Actually, if it is equal applicable to digital government. So actually, I highlight the bottom two areas, the bottom two A, that is the appetite, appetite and also ability. Try to imagine that digital government is talking about digital government services for the public community, for the business, especially medium and small medium enterprises, etc. Okay. So it is very important we need to make sure the user, the potential user of digital government services understand why they need it. Okay, so that is awareness. It's far more important that that appetite is very important. It's more than communication. It's a kind of education. Try to elicit the needs of the user so they know, okay, I need that digital government services. So it's very important. The last A is ability. Of course, it's digital literacy. Even we have the infrastructure, even if we have the digital services, but the user do not have the skill, do not have the digital literacy to manage it, to master it. It is no use. So it's very important that the last two A are very important to ensure we have the proper utilization of digital infrastructure and also digital services. And digital services including digital government services. Okay. So that is the regulatory goals. Okay, next. Okay, it's a very interesting definition of digital government. We always talk about e-government. Sometimes we talk about digital government. We remind that they're different. They're totally different things. If you are talking about e-government, it is the traditional definition that said yesterday. Now we are talking about digital government. So here is the, here is the study by the OECD Council of the digital government around the world. Okay, of course, I refer to the OECD uh, members. So it say e-government in the past referred to the use of ICT as a tool. So in other words, just a tool to make the government better. Better in terms of what? More efficient. For example, once we introduced smartphone as a DIY devices to help the government more efficient, it's just a e-government initiative. Why? Because that smartphone do not really transform the processes of the government. Okay, so in other words, if we move a step forward, digital government refer to the use of digital technology as an integrated part of the, of the government modernization strategy. So in other words, it's a long-term process of emerging embedding the use of digital technology for digital information within the government. For what? For the delivery of digital government services to the public. So the key word is to create public value. I, I remember there's a question about why we need digital government. Why? Because we would like to have better public value in terms of what? For, for example, better life of our citizen. Another thing is more important is more competitive Cambodia, to make Cambodia more competitive. For example, better e-commerce, better trade, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's very important. So a summary is put in black. Okay, so you could read it. I don't read it. Okay, so the key word is to improve the life of citizens and also to improve the overall competitiveness of businesses and also the government, actually, in Cambodia. Next slide. So I put up here is some of the evolution toward digital government. Digital government is not anywhere. It is a process. It's continued evolution. Why? Because technology are changing. Digital technology are changing. So we need to change. We need to adapt to the changes. Okay. Connect is the first stage. We hope the digital government or e-government to connect the public community. Okay. So it is the starting point. So in that starting point, it's just a presence. Okay, that's a website. Government is there. Government service is there. It's just a presence. So in other words, yes, we gradually move it to inclusion. Citizens will be included through 
the early stage of e-government. Okay. So in that stage, it is featured by what? The government just opens something to the public. They don't know whether the public need it, or they don't know whether the public like it. Okay, that's the first day, e-government. Now, we would like to move forward to make it more interact, more engaged. So in other words, in the past, it's a discrete uh, transaction. We become app-like app -like, uh, app -like transaction. So in other words, if you have an app, that app provide the digital government services. It's interactive. So of course, it's really good, right? So in other words, it has changed from government output to customer-centric. In other words, the government service is centric around the, the customer needs. Okay. Of course, if we move it forward, we transform and empower the citizen and the public community, the medium and small M uh, SME, etc., so as they could help themselves. So in other words, digital government is just more than the digital government services. We would like to make use of their services to transform individual, to transform mediums and SME and other business so as they could help themselves. They will feel empowered to do other things. Okay, so it's very, the, the vision is really big and actually it's the benefit. And then Cambodian will be highly competitive in the region, okay, in the digital economy. Next, next, okay. So I don't read it through, I just read the, uh, the red line. Okay, as I mentioned, it is integration. How to integrate digital technology within the government operation, processes, etc. So that's why we have the panelists today invited from the government. Okay, actually they're expert in what? In public administration reform. So we are talking about reform. Okay, reform is what? I don't know, maybe we, we, we enter into detailed discussion later. Okay, so in other words, it includes a number of things. It includes government capacity, workflow, business processes, operation, methodology, and different framework. And that's why today we light up a panelist comprising of the government officer responsible for digital government, as well as two experts, one from uh, Viettel, and actually you have more than 30 years in digital government implementation and different digital technology framework architecture. So you see white hair. You see the, the length of experience, yes, okay. So they, they, next to him is one Huawei. Oh, again, he's an expert in smart city solution. Smart city is part of uh, a, a, a digital government or government digitization. Okay, so anyway, so what I do here, I would like to set a scene. So uh, actually we will touch upon three things. Number one, what is digital government services in Cambodia? Okay, what are the challenges? What are the challenges and opportunity of digital government or government digitization? And the last one, what are the best practices and what are the solutions? Okay, so actually we just look at three things. Okay, okay, ready? Okay, we move forward and I hand it over to Dr. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chang. So, Next, uh, before uh, giving the first question to our panelists, I would like to sum up that the uh, digital government need two sides, one uh, people side, another one is technology side, right? We need, and with the specific application to the government in order to provide the, be the better public service delivery to our people. So the first question I would like to ask uh, His Excellency Jokbunna. He is the Under Secretary, uh, Secretary of State at the Ministry of uh, Civil Service and also the Chairman of the Civil Service Reform Committee. And um, uh, my first question to you is that, uh, is that Excellency, could you please uh, share with us please, briefly um, about the public uh, administrative reform and the uh, need of technology? Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, McGrath. So, uh, I would like to share something about uh, the government uh, vision in terms of uh, how we are going to use uh, technology to improve uh, public administration. Uh, for the government vision, we want to build administration clean, strong, smart, and people-centric. So, in to achieve this vision, one of our main strategy is 
ICT use in public sector for the service delivery uh, to improve efficiency of the public administration, uh, promote information sharing across government agency, and also to disclose information to the public. We can see from our uh, previous uh, speaker about uh, what has been done in terms of improving service delivery for business registration. It's not, it, it does not happen only in Ministry of Commerce. We can see uh, this has been uh, uh, done in other ministry, for example, uh, taxation uh, general department in terms of uh, uh, facilitating uh, taxation process, uh, payment process, uh, custom uh, driving license, uh, construction process. So uh, uh, the government has been doing hard in terms of uh, uh, using technology to improve efficiency in our service delivery. We can uh, uh, respond to the increasing demand of the people by taking opportunity availability of technology. So I, I see that we, we got the question why, at the beginning, why we, we need uh, digitalization. We need digitalization not only for the private sector, but not only public sector, but for the whole society. It is about the demand and supply, it's about competitiveness of the country. I can give you just small example when I, I went to, to uh, take the service from one agency. The space is very uh, small and uh, it's, it was crowded by the service user, and I heard from our young uh, uh, people, young uh, uh, user, they say that why the agency don't use online application, online form, that we facilitate the process uh, for the people, for the citizen. So it is the demand from our user. So the government, the public administration, need to respond to this need. We cannot keep our business as usual. As in the past, we have to keep ourselves more effective, more efficient, more updated to catch up with technology. That's what I want to share with the audience first. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Excellency Jokuna. So to continue that, I would like to switch from the demand of, uh, in terms of uh, demand of technology for conducting the digitalization of in different uh, government ministry and agency. So I move to Mr. Ning Mao, Deputy Director General of ICT. Could you please briefly introduce the the vision of the digital government and also the current drafting of the digital government uh, policy. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, actually, Mr. Post and Telecommunication of Cambodia uh, just uh, draft the uh, digital government policy. The drafting is not yet uh, finished. It's just uh, at the beginning stage. And uh, we have proposed the vision of the draft policies is to improve the people livelihood through better digital services. And the goal of the uh, draft policy is to develop the digital government at uh, national and sub-national level with the focus on three main points. Number one is the uh, quality of the digital uh, government services, and number two, we focus on the digital security, and number three is the sustainability of the uh, services. And uh, we expect that uh, after we have developed the digital government, it should help us to 
improve the quality of administrative management of the public institutions, and also enhance the efficiencies and effectiveness of the uh, public services. And uh, we hope that uh, digital government will also help us to strengthen the collaboration between the government institutions, private sectors, and also the citizen of Cambodia. We will also use the digital government as a platform for the promotion of the digital skill and also the uh, digital industry and innovation. We have proposed some of the strategies, including number one is to develop a collaboration platform and mechanism that could link the government institutions, private sectors, and the citizens to participate and collaborate in the uh, development of the uh, public policies and public decision making. And uh, we would also develop and enhance the digital government system by using common digital infrastructure, common digital and data platform, and use the integration services. And number three, we uh, encourage the public-private partnership. We encourage the uh, private sectors to participate in providing the uh, digital infrastructures, develop the digital uh, application, and providing some uh, like uh, security solutions to the government. And uh, we also are concerned about the uh, digital uh, capability. So we're going to develop the digital capability framework and provide training to the government officials, businesses, and the citizen. We also uh, try to uh, develop the uh, digital security framework and mechanism to enhance the uh, digital security and promote the trust in the use of digital uh, government. And we uh, would like to develop the, uh, this is just proposed, develop the digital government fund that could ensure the uh, development and operation of the digital government because uh, we facing a lot with the uh, fund when we uh, develop the digital government. And uh, we also uh, have to uh, develop the necessary law and regulatory framework for supporting the development and operation of digital government. So this is a brief thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to uh, go to Mr. Le Kokshu, right? <laughs> Mr. Le Kokshu is from Vitel Group. He has more than three decades of experience in IT sector. <laughs> so I hope that he can provide very simple and short uh, answer to the first questions. So uh, the first question is, please, Briefly describe the train of technology for digital government applications. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, today um, in the world now, people are saying um, uh, about many uh, train uh, for technology train for digital government, uh, like uh, AI, like uh, smart digital workspace, and modernization of uh, civil services, or even and even the blockchain, for example. But uh, today I want to point out uh, three uh, 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 important um, technology train uh, that uh, I, I, I think that it is suitable for developing country like Vietnam and Cambodia. So uh, the first uh, train is uh, mobile government. So people uh, said uh, uh, saying about uh, mobile government for many years, but in fact I think. Uh, for uh, country like Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, mobile government has just arrived. For example, uh, uh, with, with the development of the mobile network, now people can use the application uh, anywhere uh, at any time, right? And in Vietnam now, 
all of uh, our uh, manager of uh, uh, government uh, agencies can use the uh, tablet and use the uh, mobile signature to sign a uh, document anywhere at any time. And uh, another news is that uh, uh, from the 1st of uh, this uh, April, Vietnam will conduct uh, the national uh, population census in which we will use a tablet to collect uh, the, the data from citizens and to conduct the first uh, mobile-based uh, census in the country. So it is a very good news. And the second uh, trend I want to mention uh, is about the development of uh, the e-government uh, basing on a well-defined uh, enterprise architecture. So uh, enterprise architecture is a high level of uh, a system. Uh, so digital e-government and uh, digital government is very complicated. So if uh, we don't have uh, a good design and follow the good design from the beginning, we will uh, go to a situation like uh, now we have uh, many systems which are uh, separate in the silo and cannot uh, communicate each with the other. Uh, so uh, many countries uh, in the world already develop uh, the enterprise architecture. For example, uh, India in uh, 2018 already developed uh, India e-government framework. And uh, recently, Malaysia in the 2018 uh, has released uh, what called My Gov EA, mean uh, Malaysia Enterprise Government Enterprise Architecture. Regarding uh, Vietnam, now uh, we have spent already nine months to develop our first uh, enterprise architecture framework. And we, uh, uh, the, uh, the, in the, this May, uh, the, our government will publish uh, this uh, framework. And we hope that uh, at the end of this year, we can develop, we can build uh, the whole government enterprise architecture for Vietnam. And uh, this will uh, help us to go faster uh, and we can achieve the, the digital uh, government maybe uh, in a, uh, a short time, maybe uh, from five to ten years from now. Uh, the third uh, trend I want to mention is uh, the development of uh, digital identity. So uh, you know that identity uh, is one of the most important uh, pillar of the e-government. Uh, and uh, in the um, uh, IR 4.0, uh, every entity uh, will have a counterpart in digital world, or called uh, digital identities. So uh, this uh, entity can include uh, uh, people, uh, enterprise, uh, uh, organization, and even devices, for example, in the smart city implementation. Uh, so in order to access uh, uh, the digital services and uh, to access uh, the digital uh, resources uh, securely, uh, we need uh, uh, to, to require that every uh, entity will be uh, authenticated um, in a reliable manner. Uh, but uh, the identity um, issue is uh, not so, so easy because um, all of the identity programs are expenses uh, and uh, take a long time to implement, and some of them fail. Uh, so uh, to resolve this issue, uh, many countries now are taking approach of uh, federated uh, identity. So this means uh, this government will um, build what call a trusted digital uh, uh, identity framework. Yeah, uh, to, and use this uh, to govern uh, the identity, uh, digital identity ecosystem in the country. So uh, by this model, the government will uh, accept many uh, provider uh, besides of the authorized uh, government uh, uh, agency like police. Uh, the government will accept uh, a, uh, um, other uh, provider, identity provider. Uh, different kind of provider from uh, identity provider, uh, credential management uh, uh, service provider, and attribute provider, etc. 
So uh, 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 other um, organization and uh, private sector can participate in this uh, uh, identity, uh, uh, digital identity uh, ecosystem. And uh, so, and uh, I also want to mention that um, in this uh, digital identity uh, ecosystem, the mobile operator will play a very uh, important role because uh, many um, experts say that uh, uh, the mobile operator are the only one who can uh, uh, solve the challenges, digital uh, uh, identity challenges, uh, uh, what uh, we see on the ground. So uh, I, d I d hope that uh, this, my uh, perspective, can help school for you in development of uh, the digital development in Cambodia. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So next I would like to move to uh, Mr. Hang Jung Sia. Yes, um, I call you Mr. Han, right? Okay. <laughs> Mr. Han. So could you please uh, briefly, very brief, uh, describe the smart city solution and also the contribution, its contribution to better connecting people and government? Thank you, Excellency. So, well, uh, first letting compared to Mr. Le Kwok Hu, only two-thirds of your experience and two-thirds of your hair. <laughs> so, but well, um, of my 22 years um, doing ICT, I spent half of that time with the Singapore government. So I've seen um, Singapore government where we started with the informatization to e-government, digital government to smart city or smart nation. So it's very interesting because of the small fluctuations along the way. But basically, my personal experience, the way I distill it, the way I see it is this. Digital government or e-government, we are really talking about the government delivering services to the people and to the businesses. That is the core business at the end of it. So it talks about interaction with them. It talks about getting information from them. It talks about giving them services, helping them, you know, bring, bring them up along the poverty line, whatever. That's all it takes delivering to bring to that. But when we talk about from digital government and move to smart city, the, the case gets slightly bigger. In, the, in this instance, there might be slightly more players, like could be tourists, there could be investors that we might be looking at. But again, it still boils down to interactions between them. How do they talk to each other? How do they communicate? How do they share information? How do they share data? And that's where it starts to get interesting because I think some of the analysts have, have predicted that by 2035, we are, we are, or 2025, we are going to see 50 billion to 75 billion interconnected devices. We're going to see 90 zettabytes data just from those IoT devices. Or we are going to see 135 zettabytes of data from everything. So how are you going to manage that? So that's why I think it's very, very important that from a smart city perspective, because ultimately, Cambodia, as you embark on your journey from where we are now, from starting from digital uh, government, digital economy, smart city, smart nation, that is where the challenges will be from the managing of the data. That will be one key challenges that you have to watch out for. So from, from the way I see it, uh, and that's really very important, if you are able to manage that well, that really means that you're going to have a richer interaction with your people, with the businesses, with all the stakeholders, and you're able to provide better services and you're be able to provide more intimate relationship with them so that everybody can move together. And that's, what, that's how I see it. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. So I would like to give the floor to uh, my colleague C.W. Chung and to conduct... Uh, Okay, uh, time is running short. So I decided to combine. Actually, I have part two and part three questions. Now I combine it in one part. And uh, okay, so first of all, uh, we would like to move on to implementation, okay? And what are the challenges and what would be the opportunities that we could leverage, okay? So first of all, let us turn, turn, turn around to, to ask uh, uh, Buner. So I guess you have identify or prioritize some digital government services in the pipeline, I guess. Or you have done some of them, or you have developed some of them, or you plan to develop it, next step. 
So could you share with us what are your prioritized needs of high potential digital government? Thank you for uh, raising this point. Uh, for the government point of view, we try to classify uh, uh, category of uh, public service. Public service that are related to uh, service uh, and uh, business environment. Uh, some service that are related to daily life of the people and other service. So uh, now we are working hard uh, try to uh, improve service delivery uh, related to business uh, environment to build uh, competitiveness for the business uh, sector uh, to keep this sector remain competitive and attractive. So uh, you can see uh, business registration, you can see taxation process has been improved, uh, etc. And for the daily life of the citizen, are also very uh, important ID. Uh, even we don't use a very high uh, uh, technology for the ID uh, management uh, uh, system, but we, we have moved uh, from traditional way of uh, uh, doing business to one level of uh, uh, managing uh, uh, ID uh, uh, system. And uh, uh, <coughs> we can see in other sector, driving license, uh, we call registration. Uh, in the past, we faced very uh, difficult uh, problem in uh, asking for the uh, vehicle registration. But now IT uh, system has been introduced and improved uh, this kind of service for our citizen. Uh, for the future, uh, in the near future, the government will try to push this to be better and to be more connected, integrated. Now we can see that all these services, even we don't, uh, some ministries, they say it is not standalone project. But we can see that it is standalone project. It's some kind of uh, silo uh, uh, process uh, improvement and development. We need to be more integrated within uh, the government. Uh, we need to share information across the government sector, we have a big uh, room for improvement. Uh, and technology can uh, uh, help us in this kind of uh, improving service uh, delivery. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, now I move on to uh, some of the challenges in the government digitization. Okay, so uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Mao, about say, uh, say for example, because there are a number of uh, uh, challenges, I guess. Okay, so let us focus uh, 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 a few of them, so you can illustrate. Okay, the first one is the skill set. Okay, I, I think first of all, uh, there's a skill demand for the build up of the digital government. Another thing, the, the, the civil servant may also need to equip the digital literacy so that they could use it all. So the first one is skill set. The second thing is infrastructure and platform. And the last bit is financial budget. Okay. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, first, with the uh, digital skill for Cambodia, I think digital skill is still one of the barriers to the adoption of the digital technology because the uh, uh, digital literacy rate in Cambodia is still very low, and we still also uh, lack of the uh, expert in the digital. Of course, we do have, but not enough for the development of the uh, digital technology in Cambodia, as well as the digital government. Actually, uh, before uh, developing, I mean, before starting uh, developing this uh, draft uh, digital government policy, we have also uh, develop the we call uh, the uh, policy for telecom and ICT development in Cambodia, and also we mentioned on the development of the uh, uh, digital skill that uh, we propose that uh, the student finish high school also with have the uh, at least the basic uh, digital skill, and 
we encourage uh, students to uh, take courses in the uh, digital technologies and ICT. And regarding the uh, infrastructures and platform, as uh, Excellency Buna uh, already uh, mentioned, that uh, we each ministry they usually they have their own. Uh, uh, they use their own infrastructures, they develop their own application using, using different technologies with low uh, interoperabilities and also uh, usability. So uh, in the future, we have to think of the integration, to think of uh, developing uh, a platform that can uh, be uh, used in the same standard for the whole government. And also, we should also have some, uh, you know, develop some uh, standard for the digital services. And in terms of the uh, finance, we uh, usually have uh, difficulty. Uh, the government usually do not have uh, enough uh, budget for the development of the digital government. Actually, uh, most of the uh, project was done, uh, uh, the big project usually from the support from the uh, development partners. And uh, after the uh, project period finished, we uh, still have hard time to maintain and continue the job of the system. So, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, we think of uh, creating a digital government fund that could collect the fund from different sources to sustain the, the, the digital government services. Thank you. Okay, interesting. interesting. Well, the digital government development fund. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, Mao mentioned about uh, you know infrastructure and platform. They would like to achieve interoperability of different digital government program application, blah blah blah. So they need standards. So I think it is a good opportunity to seek the advice from the, from, from you two expert, right? So actually, uh, I would like to uh, ask seek your advice, you know, from your experience working in that area, either. Uh, IT, digital government, or e-government implementation, and also smart city, right? So, uh, would you please uh, 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 talk about, share your insight in terms of how to manage or deploy digital technology in government, and also the uh, adoption appropriate digital architecture or framework, okay, so as to uh, facilitate or efficient uh, the digitization of government. Okay, so uh, first of all, I need to say that uh, the uh, digital government is the future. So uh, digital government is a part of the IR 4.0. So it is a revolution. So if it is a revolution, it's not easy to do. So it is very important. And I think the most uh, uh, the, the biggest challenge is how to, to go in the right way to achieve the digital uh, government. So uh, we are uh, following the maturity model of uh, uh, e-government of uh, Gartner. We need to uh, move from the e-government to open uh, government and to uh, data-centric uh, government. And after that, we will achieve the digital government. It will take maybe uh, from uh, five to 10 years. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, we are in Vietnam, we are planning to achieve this maybe by the uh, 2025, for example. So it is take a long way. So it is very important that we need to go uh, in the right way. That may that mean uh, we need to define the good, uh, the, the right uh, uh, strategy for digital government. And we need to uh, build a right uh, enterprise architecture for digital government, and we need to have a uh, right uh, uh, roadmap, uh, the master plan for implementi implementation, and to choose the right technology, and of course, the, to uh, choose the right partner. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'll just add on to what uh, Mr. Hu said. Um, I think one, one thing, can you hear me? Right. Okay. Um, everybody, um, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Puner, um, CW, everybody kept talking about the word integration. You know, integration is a very easy word to say, but what does it really mean? So 
based on what I've seen, you know, um, uh, in, in the years that I spent with the Singapore government, with Huawei, I had a lot of opportunities to interact with a lot of governments on this. And I found that one, one of the biggest problem really is getting people, simple things like getting people to execute, to, to share data, uh, to, to interoperate, to talk to one another. And that, that was what I found. That's the key problem that I found all the time. And technology can solve part of that. But more importantly, my personal feel is that we also need to consider analog factors. Analog factors like governance structure when it comes to execution. Other aspects like using enterprise architecture to guide the people, to move people. Um, other, and another one could be considering the use of data hubs, putting all this together so that force everybody to share. From, so from a government's perspective, we know that we, we have a, a, govern, a steering committee at the highest level. We get somebody senior, like the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister to lead the committee. Yes, but at the middle layer, the lower layer, we should also consider putting in structures, like maybe a government CIO, ministry CIO setup, that, so that you are able to get all the ministries to align together so that when we execute, we do it together, the same pace, on the same way, using the same policies. So that's why uh, technology is important. I'm from Huawei. I would want to sell more technology. But more importantly, consider analog factors. And I think this was one thing that uh, His Excellency, Mr. Minister of Commerce, also brought up just now. When he was sharing with his transformation, he was talking about rewarding you know, the people. And that's an analog factor that's equally important. So this is one thing that I would like you all to consider. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, time is really cutting short. So we need to wrap it up uh, uh, within 10 minutes, okay? Or five to 10 minutes, okay? So it is my last question for every panelist here. So you will be given one minute. Okay. So I would like you to summarize and try to find the most important top two key messages from your capacity from your experience in terms of digital government or digital government digitization. Okay, top two key messages. It could be a successful factor, it's a salient issue, or other thing. Okay, try to think about it. I understand you have more than 10 key messages, but I only need two from your capacity. Okay, say for example, administrative reform, Okay, you start first, okay. Uh, of course, like our uh, speaker mentioned that ICT, maybe it is not a, a difficult uh, uh, issue for developing and implementing, but there are other issues behind that to be obstacle for moving forward. So there are... So, uh, I have been asked to raise only two points. Uh, so I try to combine two points. <laughs> uh, one point is about leadership and capacity. When I talk about leadership, leadership at all levels, from the government's levels, from the technical uh, technocrats, uh, administration, at each level, so leadership must be proactive, active, supportive for technology in administration. And people in administration should be capable to understand, to accept, to support, and implement technology in terms of improving their business process. It's one part. Another big issue is about coordination that our speaker just mentioned. Uh, in our strategy, we try to improve policy and coordination alignment between not only across uh, government agency, but within line ministry itself, within ministry itself, and also across the whole government. You have a good policy, you have a good strategy, good action, 
But if people don't talk to each other, don't work to support each other, you cannot go anywhere. You just talk, talk, and talk. But talk within your agency, within your unit, you don't open your minds. Technology is open, but your mind is not open. So coordination and alignment in terms of policy, in terms of strategy, in terms of activity, in terms of uh, action are very important. Okay, thank you, Boner. Actually, it's a very strong advocation and also a call, an urgent call for digitization. And I even see his tears coming out almost, okay? <laughs> so it's really serious at the time. Okay, anyway, okay, Bao. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the most important things for us to do is to finish the draft, the Utah government policy, and uh, to get it adopted is number one. And number two is to have a law on the digital government because without the law, it's not really uh, you know, stable in the implementation. And number three, we need the political will. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, <laughs> we need the uh, political will and the commitment from all the stakeholders, including the government institutions, the private sector, the citizens, also the uh, uh, development partners. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, I, I will have uh, two uh, maybe key uh, message or key uh, two uh, recommendations. So the first one is to uh, follow the mobile first uh, policy in uh, to develop in uh, mobile government, mobile payment, mobile commerce, etc. So it uh, will uh, leverage uh, the, the our current uh, network uh, mobile network, which are very good now. So it's uh, we can do now. Uh, and the second uh, key message is, is, is uh, to uh, we need to start the uh, development of the digital uh, uh, government by building the enterprise architecture right from now. This is very important, and it will support us uh, for the whole uh, uh, way to, uh, to digital government. Thank you. Well. Uh well, for me, the way I see it, just one idea, whole of government, whole of government. You know, when we do things, do everything together as a government. Resources are limited. Time is limited. Don't, dupli don't duplicate, don't replicate, don't do redundant stuff. Think together, do it together as one. And that's, I think, the best thing that we can do to help the country to move forward. Yes. Thank you. So I try, thank you for all panelists and uh, my co-moderator. So I try to recap our sessions. So in short, the technology revolution is there. It's coming. Technology train is coming. So we can see that uh, we are in the context of a uh, digital economy and fourth industrial revolutions. And at the same time, the technology have already transformed the way we live and the way we, 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 we work and also the way we uh, making money from that. And indeed, the social network has transformed a lot in terms of the people perception on uh, the way other people are doing because uh, almost everything is on the hand through the mobile communication. So the in, it is, we need to acknowledge the fact that uh, the expectation of the citizen is become much and higher than before. So the government need to respond well to those demands of the citizen. Otherwise, the government will collapse. So the government almost has no choice at this moment. Decide improvement the internal process to respond to the increasing, to respond to the increasing demand of the, the citizen. So to do so, they have the government have no other choice 
desired adoption technology. It's not only the digital technology, it can be different type of technology, whatever it is. But the adoption of technology in order to promote innovation inside the government itself. And promoting innovation, I think that with Excellency Yubuna have already clearly mentioned that the human factor is first, technology factor is second. Technology is always is almost always available, but the, if the human do not want to adopt it, then it cannot be success. So adoption, the human factor is come from the political will. It's not only political will, but all the stakeholder inside the government will that willing to change, willing to moving from this situation to another the situation better than now. And then the technology come after, we need, according to Mr. Hu, we need to think of the long term development with the, with the, the, with the establishment of a technical framework and uh, enterprise architecture in order to secure and order to sustain the services that uh, deliver through the means of the technology. So I think that thank you. And uh, I would like to open the question to uh, the floor. So one or two questions, please. So our, uh, <laughs> yes, our participants have questions in the speaker time, right? Keynote speaker time. So my question again, is, so what is the government's stance on uh, keeping data in the cloud? Does it need to stay within its borders or can it be kept internationally, for, for example, like financial institutions or even the government data? Okay. So actually, the, the answer, the, the question should go directly to the panelists, but anyway, my colleagues have transferred the question to me, so to give the answer. Actually, we have not yet the uh, data governance policy yet, so everything is not yet decided, right? But it's up to uh, yourself, the owner of the data. You need to consider where you, you, where, 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 you, where you trust to store the data, whether locally or uh, outside. But if you store the data outside, if something happens, the law enforcement cannot help you. The Cambodian law, they have the physical boundary, have the physical boundary. So we cannot in doing the enforcement outside the Cambodian territory. So this, I think that this is the very short answer to you and I do not have a further answer to that, right? I actually try to answer this question. As a general trend, actually cross-border, cross-border data migration or whatever in the financial sector is used to be very restricted. It depends on the regime you are, you are adopted. Okay, for example, the U.S. cross-border regime is more stringent. It's more stringent than, than, than EU. And for example, Singapore is more stringent than Hong Kong. So that's why Hong Kong attracted a number of uh, data center applications there because the, 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 the regime on cross-border uh, data uh, migration is net stringent. So it's very complex. It determines on what are your cross-border data migration regime and what do you want to do and which, uh, uh, which regime you would like to adopt. Moreover, whenever we, call, we, we say cross-border cross data migration or wherever, Actually, it is not, it is not uh, 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 one goal. Actually, there are different data requirements. So in other words, uh, different data, some data need to be kept locally. Some data could be migrated or whatever. So in other words, there's a layer approach. So it's not a, a, a very simple answer. Okay, I, I don't know whether I answer your question. Yeah, I, let me compliment to this that uh, as I mentioned before, that here the data governance policy is not yet established, right? So in this current practice, the owner of the data should decide from economic benefit and security benefit. Do you, do you have an idea when the policy will be provided? 
I don't know yet. Maybe it's coming in the uh, next uh, couple of years. <laughs> Other question, please? Good evening, His Excellencies and the pa honored panel. I'm uh, Victoria Ngopat from uh, CAMED, lecturer from CAMED. Um, just have a question on um, about cybersecurity law, I assume that it will be included uh, within uh, digital, um, also uh, government law. Is that uh, the correct assumption? Cybersecurity law. Yes. Will, it, will it be included at the same time also? When you will publish in a, a few years? So you you want to ask to come uh, to the Cambodian government? Or yes, <laughs> to, yes. To to our panelists. No, no, the government, the Cambodian government. Um, actually, uh, right now we uh, don't have the draft cybersecurity law yet, but we are drafting the uh, cybercrime law. Cybercrime. Yeah, it's already in draft. And okay. uh, I think uh, type security law already uh, also very important in the future, but uh, we just uh, do it one by one. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. So please, one more, one last question if you have. Otherwise, I would like to terminate this uh, session. No more question. Okay, I would like to close this session. So please give an applause to our panelists and uh, moderator, please. Thank you.